Welcome to another episode of Dr. Brooke on the Block. It's time to grab a seat, buckle up, and take a ride with me through the wild, wild west of the Web3 universe, where we're going to learn all about coins and tokens, NFTs and contracts, digital real estate and the metaverse, and so much more. There is a lot to get through on the block, but I am here to pave the way and help you avoid those nasty pitfalls and rug pulls so you don't get hurt. I'm going to also introduce you to some interesting characters along the way. Are you ready? Your ride starts now. Hey, hey, Dr. Brooke here with another incredible ride through the wild, wild west of Web3. Before we start this ride, I want to introduce you to my co-pilot today, Breno. Breno is the founder and CEO at uh, Bodo, and which is a no-code platform that allows anyone to build and share uh, um, automation. So before Bodo, Breno was head of revenue intelligence for Ripple, which I do kind of want to talk about a little bit today, and has been in the blockchain space since 2016. He's been coding since he was 12 years old and has an MBA and a B, uh, Bachelor's of Science in Mechatronics Engineering from a school in Brazil. Welcome to the show, Breno. So excited that you're here with us today. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you for inviting. Excited to Yeah. Absolutely. So first question out the gate that I like to ask all my guests on the show is what their origin story is into this incredible wild world of Web3, blockchain, all of that. How did you get into this rabbit hole? <laughs> um, yeah, fair enough. I I was always passionate about technology. So as you mentioned, like I started coding, I was 12 and I was I literally... Uh, I had a um, a computer next to my crib and bed as I was growing up, you know, like, so my, my father's computer, they were into technology. And so it was kind of like a rare opportunity. Most of my friends in Brazil didn't have that. So I grew up, you know, with a computer next to me, opening computers, assembling my own computers and started coding and, and got into technology. So I was always fascinated uh, by technology. And then um, when I heard about blockchain, I was like, okay, cool. This is super interesting. You know, I understand the concepts because I studied mechatronics engineering. I had uh, studied cryptography. Um, so, so for me, I was like, okay, cool, great. Uh, this mm -hmm. is new and I want to get into it. Um, I, I, I bought my first Bitcoin in 2016 and, and I started looking to how to shift my career towards that, uh, uh industry. Um, and I got into repo in 2017. Um, I also was very interested in the idea of using uh, crypto to move money. Um, I had worked before mm -hmm. before my MBA. I had worked in in finance, and and I had uh, I was responsible for moving money internationally through exotic currencies like Africa, Brazil, and mm -hmm. other places. And it was a nightmare. Uh, you know, I remember <laughs> one time like twenty million dollars just disappeared for, a, and we couldn't find out for a whole full, whole week. And you tried to reach out to Swift. It's it's like it's a nightmare. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm bought into the idea of not using Swift. That's an, you know, for whoever has done that in corporate finance, probably knows the pain. So I was like, okay, I know the pain. If this can solve, great. So, so yeah, more or less how it started. So that's how, so then you connected with the Ripple company back in 20, so you got in 2016, you got hired on by Ripple in 2017. We're with them, it looks like until just Almost last years, year, yeah. like a year ago. Um, what, what, what's that been like, that whole process with them? That was great. I mean, um, I, I was working for other startups before, um, okay. from Bay Area. So I was, I, ne I never really liked working for big corporations. So Ripple was, uh, when at the time I joined, there were a little bit less than 200 people, mm -hmm. um, everyone super talented, uh, some incredible characters from, from the crypto community there, yeah. you know, so, um, so it was great to go to San Francisco, meet everyone and, um, I, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed the the culture of the company. Um, most of the people I worked with, and uh, so for me, it was incredible. I, I I've done quite a few roles while I was there. Uh, very dynamic, like like a startup, like you would expect. So, yeah. Yeah, very cool. So now that you're not there, I do have to ask the question because uh, some people, whether they are understand like know about the space they may have heard ripple xrp all of it what do you how do you feel do you feel bearish or bullish on the outcome with the sec lawsuit oh um very bullish about the outcome yeah. I, I think 
you know, uh, seeing what's going on and uh, yeah, yeah I, I've been following up. I mean, uh, yeah. of course I have shares on the company, so I'm very much interested in the outcome of the, <laughs> of the lawsuit. So, uh, but I, I'm very bullish. I've seen the things and I, I really a bit disappointed with the SEC, you know, not, not really, I mean, disappointed because I didn't expect much of it, but uh, it's, yeah. it, 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 SEC has a history with, uh, with innovation. Right, like mm-hmm. uh, I was reading mm-hmm. a book from, um, you know, the, the the founder of the MBA school I studied at. Uh, is also known as being the father of the venture capital industry. So he oh, was the first venture capitalist who made loads of money. Uh, he was a professor in Harvard, and uh, uh, and and he had <laughs> he had a pile apparently when they you know after he died and all that they, they, he had a pile of documents on in his office, all stamped uh, as uh, they were all letters to the SEC. All stamped wow. not sent because of uh, legal advice. And they were all yeah. like, really like, because apparently they raided his office and a bunch of stuff, you know, like, uh, and, and, you know, so they were very much trying to shut him down. Yeah. And imagine without him, most likely we wouldn't have venture capitalists like it is today. Right. So, you know, it, it, it's a history that keeps repeating in terms of innovation and the SEC or regulators in general. I understand they must strike a balance, but sometimes they go too far. Yeah, they cross. They definitely cross the line. So I I do agree with you. You have a lot more insider information, having worked at the company, and the company is still in existence today. Um, SEC lawsuit hopefully will be finished before the end of twenty twenty two ends. Um, so it's cool to hear your perspective on where that is. So that was a whole entire separate deal. Having seen on your you know resume that you had you know, ties to Ripple, I, I def- definitely had to ask that mm-hmm. question. But more importantly, so let's talk about what you're doing now, um, which is Bodo I- I- Bodo.io. And that is essentially a bot system that people can create, like a drag and drop. Like when I mentioned uh, the intro for you, no code, they drag and drop the pieces that they want, kind of create the bots that they're looking for. Explain a little bit more. Um, my audience may not understand how bots work necessarily, so maybe mm-hmm. just kind of give us an overview of how the company works and what it's what it does. Yeah, um, the whole idea is to you know, um, I especially during COVID, saw more people getting into retail investment and crypto, mm-hmm. and a lot of the people getting in were less uh, techy, let's say, mm-hmm. and and people would ask me for help. Hey, can you build mm-hmm. this bot to do this or do that? And you know, the barrier for people to automate tasks that they would normally do daily uh, it was quite high because you, you have to know how to code, uh, even though the, most of the data is available out there. So let's say you want to be informed about the market movements or you want to be informed about something specific that you're, uh, you know, it's important to you, such as, I don't know, the price of Bitcoin or whatever mm-hmm. the SEC tweets about and, <laughs> and, and all those things, you know, um, and you want to, uh, so, you want to be notified or you want to automate something based on that, right? You, mm-hmm. um, it's very hard today. You don't, mm-hmm. especially in the Web3 space, there are not many tools that allow you to do that. So the idea was, how can I build a platform that allows anyone to, without the need to code, to put their logic there? So so let's say, oh, if the price does this and the gas price is that, and I receive a message based on, you know, in the news, people are talking about this, uh, sell all my coins because, you know, I'm worried about a crash. It's kind of yeah. like a stop loss, uh, if you're familiar with the, you know, the yes. term. And then, yeah, so the idea was really how to do that. The first use case we had actually was about um, uh, avoiding to get liquidated in your, uh, with your loans, like uh, if, you, if you have a loan on, on AV or, or a similar platform. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's how it all started in a hackathon. Um, yeah. Very cool. So it started as, as a protection against liquidation. And then it's kind of branched into being able to, in looking at the website, people are using it, you know, to create their Discord communities and their different, you know, I, I I guess I could see it also being used for like different NFT projects or different cryptocurrencies, like you said, even being able to track Twitter, um, what things are happening. So you guys right now, what are what are the t- statistics sitting at in terms of how many, I know it was a large number, like 77 million actions being um, yes. done with Bodo.io right now. Um, and then you're looking to like expand that a lot further, obviously. Yeah, in, in the past months, we have done about 9 million actions per month. Okay. And, you know, the those actions are mostly on the NFT space. It's okay. mostly people building their communities. We are yeah. about 
6,000 or more 6,000 Discord servers. So it's either artists or people who manage uh, specific NFT collections who use us mm -hmm. or people who manage alpha channels, uh, you know, for, for uh, traders. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are some collectors as well who use us just to be informed of what, what is out there. <clears throat> um, sometimes for their own, they receive email instead of using Discord, for example. Um, and we've seen most of the usages around NFT, uh, but we've seen yeah. quite a few, you know, uh, interesting, um, because people can build their own logic and they can share that. So, so, and we incentivize people to share that. Uh, yeah. We can see some interesting recipes that people are building and they're like, oh, I didn't think about that. And it's pretty cool. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah there, there's a lot of innovation and a lot of things that are different verticals that are possible with creating a technology like you've done. I would like to know, well, one, let's go really briefly into, you talked about, you know, people building communities like Discord, you use the word community. So why is it important right now to invest in community? And like, what do you see that future looking like? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because for Bodo itself, I also saw that as the key ingredient that I found mm -hmm. was missing from the other automation platforms. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with Zapier or IFTTT yeah. in the Web2 space, you don't have much of a community around. You know, most of the integrations you see, they're built by Zapier, right? So you go mm -hmm. to their website and say, oh, I want to get notified from a... It's like Google Sheets to, to mm -hmm. Gmail, right? Google Sheets, mm -hmm. their main use case. Google Sheets to, to Twitter, whatever. Yeah. And it's kind of like one to one and it's mostly built by them and i was like there's no way a company can build the most creative you know uh, things and i've been already proven by our, even in our early stage by our users that yeah they can be more creative than us yeah. which, which is expected um <laughs> so you know in the long term i think the community is key because uh, it's community driven content and right. the way i see this is it, it really is logic you know like if you think about this um the internet mostly people were sharing information right so web yeah. 2 is about allowing so initially web 1 the, the developers were providing the information web 2 uh people now are contributing to the information right mm -hmm. like social platforms blogs and and stuff mm -hmm. like that and a web three and automation in general now is still mostly done by the developers by the companies so what right. we're trying to do is hey actually we want the logic to be built by everyone just like mm -hmm. web 2 allowed the information to be shared by everyone we want mm -hmm. people to share their logic um, so this is really where we, where we see it going and, and why community is so important for us. Um, and then we recognize that actually many of our users have their own communities and they right. care a lot about that as well. And you, yeah. So do you guys, so if I was to create, like, let's say I create a bot on Bodo and I have my drag and drop tools and it was something maybe you didn't see, you know, in the grand scheme of things when you were building out the initial, you know, rendition of the company, and now I built out something. Is that something that can also be shared? Like, hey, Dr. Brooke did this with her community. Look at what tool she used. Um, we and it could be shared out with other, yeah, you know, platform or other customers of Bodo. Yeah, a hundred percent. So okay. we we have something we call the Bodoverse, and we launched a couple of months ago that allows exactly that. And I think okay. we have now over two hundred sixty recipes there. Fifty of them so came cool. from us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then the rest is all from the community. To be honest, okay. a lot of them don't necessarily work, you know, like before just starting using, but yeah. there are some really cool ones. And then we we, we flag them as community um, highlights. So we okay. go manually through them. Uh, yeah. Crystal, our, our head of community is doing a great job with that. And um, yeah, so if you, we do that and in the future, we're gonna have page for each creator. So okay. if you are a creator of bots, you're gonna have your own page. And in the long term, we want to remunerate the top creators, just like you know YouTube does and right. all these platforms do, with revenue sharing. So yeah, that's that's awesome. I love that idea. That's great because I the one big aspect in, in talking to a lot of people in Web three and being in the space you hear about is the whole community aspect, like people building mm -hmm. together, people you know investing together, people doing different different things that weren't done in a Web two version where you know facebook or google or whatever getting all of the revenue for us sharing our information web3 is tur turning around and kind of bringing that back to us so i think that that is amazing one thing though um about bots is people tend to have a very negative connotation about them i'm in a lot of different discord channels a lot of different nft projects that actually even tout their stats on that main bar at the very top they say how many users they have and how many bots they've banned 
Now I know bots can be like negatively looked at because, you know, people are trying to like ape in, right. To use some web three mm -hmm. terminology, they're trying to get into an NFT project and there's only X amount available. And then some people get creative and they build bots on the back end. And so they're able to like sleep in bed and their bots are, are collecting their NFTs for them while they're, you know, other people are like up all night trying to get their wallets connected and freaking out. And totally. so I could see why some people can feel so like, I hate bots. And I can see why, why some communities will turn around and block bots. But what would you say, like, how would you overcome the negative bias? And then also, I don't mean to ask you two questions in one, but Oh, how would you overcome the negative bias? And then what do you see as key differences between like good quality bots versus the bots that are just there trying to, to gather up a bunch and, you know, turn around and flip? Yeah, I know there are a lot of, there's a lot in within that question, right? So yeah, I think we start with from the beginning, I always knew that bot had a, a negative connotation overall, and that's why part of it was the decision to make bot part of the name of the company. So, yeah. so it's like the elephant in the room is there is addressed, <laughs> you know, like, and, 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 and why we made a logo that is friendly and the whole website, we aim to be more friendly and, and, you know, and inviting because uh, we know it can be, um, a little bit overwhelming, perhaps the idea of okay. using bots and it has negative connotation. So, so those are some of the reasons. Also some of the reasons why we do not do any ads. Uh, since I think most of the ads people see on bots and stuff, uh, people connect that to scams. So all mm -hmm. our growth has been word of mouth and, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, so these are part of, of how we started, um, especially creating a platform that is open that people could do anything with it. People could, we always knew that could, people could build bots to be used for bad, uh, mm -hmm. you know, intention. Mm -hmm. Right now we don't have that capability yet, but maybe at some point. Um, but some of the bots you mentioned that are kicked out, I think those are bots that pretend to be users. We don't do that. You know, okay. our bots are not, people can't do that with our bots. Uh, so, but we have seen, for example, recently, uh, last week, a community member uh, uh, flagged the use of our bot in a, in a, in a Discord that apparently is connected to a scam. And, and they said, look, these guys are using your bot to promote their scam and, uh, you know, and, it could it could happen right because people use our bots to promote their community nfts and crypto yeah. and as we know there are scams in crypto just right. like there was scams in the internet in the beginning right. of the internet and every new technology right. um so so how do we deal with them so we have now a plan to deal with those uh, situations and uh, it's important that we listen to the community and let it also kind of like self-regulate we also don't want to be unfair and block people um but we always keep in mind like uh you know, if someone uses the bot to create a recipe and share, that could be considered like an evil bot or a non-sustainable bot, for example, mm -hmm. because like you said, a bot that automates buying minting, for example, um, and then no one can get the, those minted NFTs because the bots are doing that. Mm -hmm. um, well, to that, what we are doing is, is uh, you know, um, uh, leveling the, the battlefield the kind of like, field. yeah, yeah. The, because we are letting people who, wouldn't be able to do that no coding by doing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we know that's not sustainable because if everyone had the capability of doing that, the bots wouldn't really work, uh, yeah. which might be a good thing since those bots right. are not very helpful. So, um, so yeah, I think um, um, this is this is more or less how I think about. Uh, so do you do you see any key differences then between like because I could see and it's interesting because as you were sharing. Um, the whole bot, you know, neg negative connotation aspect. I do see in the very same Discord channel that I'm thinking about in my mind as I'm sharing this with you, I do see that when A, when they onboard new people into Discord, there's a bot, right? That makes them go through all of the rules and the check marks. So they have their own as a community, they have their bots that are working on at least creating some sort of structure now there's mods that actually come in, community ma managers that come in and will respond to different things, but they have bots there to onboard or to, you know, hey, you leveled up. You commented so many times in this community, now you're a level yeah. two and you earn like points and things like that, right? So they use bots for good like that. Would you see that that would be like a big key difference between 
the negative bots that are going through, people are building bots to just get, you know, 10 different NFTs on a project so other people can't, and then they can flip them for thousands of dollars. And then the good bots being the ones that kind of help structure a sense of community within a community. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you have good bots in all use cases, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. But recently we did an audit of our, um, of our Discord community, and mm -hmm. actually the auditors ended up installing a bunch of bots. Uh, oh, wow. exactly it helped to to keep yeah. the discord healthy um, yeah. and this same auditor is is a is a big bodo user and uh he installed bodo in many in many other servers that he did audit before you know so so it's being a very good person to work with uh amazing and then uh, as you said there are many bots used for good um, yeah so you know for I'll, I'll give an example especially in the web3 space that people can use bodo bots for for a good uh, in a good way let's say you have an nft that is being so uh, you listed an nft right mm -hmm. um and the floor price moves constantly um so you need to monitor that and then mm -hmm. suddenly the floor price is going up your nft might be a rare item in that collection and what's going to happen as the floor price goes up, you might you might be selling it under the floor price, something that should be sold with a premium, right? Right. And the bot might might catch it and flip it, like you said. So so we have a bot that you can monitor the floor price, and if the floor price gets close to your NFT, you can relist it. You know, uh, ah. so, so it's going to yeah. alert you, and it's going to take you through a special page through Boto, and you can release through us, which makes the process a bit faster and easier than through through OpenSea. So it helps right. people to avoid getting their NFT bot for for a low price too cheap, they can be flipped. Um, and we, we keep building more bots in, in that sense, like avoiding liquidations, you know, uh, and, and other things. Um, we haven't built uh, bots, for example, to liquidate other people's loans, uh, yeah. which <laughs> maybe it's on the other side. It, you know, you could perceive that as an evil bot, but at the same time, it is important in the uh, in the ecosystem that you have people liquidating the loans because that's what keeps the, um, the liquid, you know, the liquidity in, in the market, and it keeps right. it uh, healthy. Because if there right. is a bad debt, it should be liquidated. And if there's Absolutely. someone willing to do so, great. Right. So we haven't built bots for that. I don't necessarily think they are evil, but but we focus on the side of let's protect people who are not who don't want to lose, you know, by accident, right? Some people just That's... genuinely cannot pay the debt. So in that case, fine then get liquidated but let's first build the ones that protect people and then we can build the ones that liquidate as well because it's important for the market right um so yeah that kind of stuff that that's an interesting perspective i i really like what you said there you know right now you're you're doing almost like the safety net around for people to be safeguarded against liquidations but if there is somebody who truly can't you know pay due on that debt, then there does need to be some liquidation because it does provide the necessary the necessary flow in the marketplace to allow things to happen that they, the way that they do. So I know I didn't like uh, prepare you for this question, but I think it's a really interesting one to ask, especially at this time when we're talking about that. So we're sitting in a time where, you know, I know you're you're in the UK, correct? Um, actually in Switzerland, but okay, um, okay, so Europe. <laughs> um, but we here in the United States, you know, we we have the United States has now issued like regulation or attempting to issue some sort of verbiage, quote unquote, and I do that quote quotes verbiage around like uh, not liquidations around regulations and trying to figure out, you know, not make it so volatile. However, this whole Web3 blockchain technology, this goes beyond the, the country borderlines of the United States or the country borderlines of Sweden or all the other countries, right? Um, it's global. So what do you see, like, how do you see regulation either being a good thing or a bad thing in the overall general ecosystem of Web3? Yeah, it's super difficult to regulate on a global scale. Scale, yeah. Um, but definitely regulation overall, I think is good in many ways, um, except over regulation. But overall, I yeah. think regulation is good because it give, gives people clarity so you can do things without worry. Like, for example, uh, we created NFTs for some people. We did very few of them, but uh, so they could get a, a lifetime use of photo. And then we were like, mm, is this legal or not? You know, and you go through all that. <laughs> then I had my... You know, when I raised funds as well, I didn't do through crypto, but I did traditional VC, but uh, but mm -hmm. still, 
um, we had terms related to potential token issue in the future. And mm. that took ages with the lawyers, all the lawyers from the, all the companies. And it's like, so all these things would be easier if regulation yeah. was clear, right? So in many ways, doing business in crypto would be easier. Today, yeah. we don't accept crypto for most of our memberships because it is not so easy. It's not just not easy to, to, to accept because most of the standard companies don't transact like Stripe. Um, right. And all because of regulation, right? And also right. because my reporting, my financial reports become a nightmare and I need to manage them. So uh, definitely regulation help without that. It will help business in general in the Web3. Mm -hmm. And even if it's only the US, to be honest, like many countries will look up to some of the other countries for that. So if the US comes out with the regulation, most countries will kind of like follow that. You know, like Swiss, Switzerland has quite a bit of regulation around crypto already, which is pretty good. Right. Um, but Switzerland is is unique and small, not, not necessarily other countries follow uh, Switzerland, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, most of our users are in the US, over 35%. So mm -hmm. um, definitely uh, clarity would help, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could I could see that. I you mentioned over regulation being a bad thing, and where I see regulation as being a good thing and in, in giving the, or in anchoring back to the examples that you had shared with you know being able to like keep the books straight and all these things that you know are are very kind of messy if you start doing cryptocurrency because right now it sounds like Bodo the plans people pay in their fiat currency wherever whatever country they're in. Um, you know, but not in cryptocurrency, even though you guys are a Web3 company. And I've interviewed a lot of people on the podcast that are running Web3 companies that accept fiat currency. So they're, the payment mechanisms are almost a Web2 yeah. with a Web3. And somebody, one of the guests, and uh, I don't remember exactly who, because I've done so many episodes now, but he had mentioned, you know, we are decentralizing. So he didn't say we are a de decentralized company. He said we are decentralizing because he's kind of in that bridge between I am a Web3 company, but we utilize Web2 financial systems to make that happen. So when it comes to those those points that like you mentioned, that makes sense in terms of regulation personally, you know, and, and of course, there's so much out there. But personally, I just feel like sometimes the the gray, like, we can't say something is black or white, like we can't say, okay, no regulation. Right now, we have no regulation, and we need all the regulation. Because what happens is, is then there's too much like, okay, we put the laws of the land in place. And then next year, there's another little thing and another little thing and another little thing and another little thing. And pretty soon, what we've been fighting for as a community in web three since the ad you know beginning stages of bitcoin saying we want decentralized for the people it almost becomes again you know government control all of it so I yeah do, yeah I mean, well it, totally and i think regulation doesn't necessarily mean government control and that's where it becomes over regulated and uh, necessarily you know uh extending um like you said, the whole goal was not to 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 have this control from from Ghana. I think the technology itself is almost impossible for the Ghana to fully control. Yes. they can kind of outlaw and all that, but it's it's hard to you know to control. Um, and and we've seen how useful that is. Like especially you know like uh, some of my friends from from Eastern Europe, uh, Ukraine, and everything said like you know. Um, when 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 the war broke, uh, they were raising funds and they used crypto for most of it. Right. And uh, you know they were journalists buying bulletproof vests and things like that for you know for mm -hmm. for providing news. And they ended up paying people in bitcoins to get those things done. Right. Because um, because the whole financial system got blocked and and it was difficult yeah. to move money around. Um, especially, I think uh, people don't realize how hard it is for cr countries that don't have liquid currencies to to transact. Most mm -hmm. currencies only have liquidity against the dollar, the euros, or, GB, or pounds and Swiss francs. Mm -hmm. So if you are in Ukraine and you want to transact with another neighboring country, guess what? You actually need to go through New York. And in times where war breaks and things, these things become very difficult. Yeah. So, you know, um, so, so having something like that is super powerful and, and mm -hmm. for the world in general, for the people um, mm -hmm. that gives you you know, an option when there is mm -hmm. none. Um, so I don't think that will, any government will be able to fully take that away from people yeah. now because it's out there. 
uh, um, but definitely having some guidance in terms of, hey, if you want to do business using these here in the U.S., here's how you should do it, go about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, would would make things better. I, I definitely see your point on guidance. The, the big thing that becomes problematic in my mind is the fact that most of these government officials and most of these regulatory bodies don't understand cryptocurrencies, don't understand tokenomics, don't understand the Web3 ecosystem, and then they're creating guidelines to mm. follow. And so that that's where it becomes, you know, if we want to truly see the change that we want to make in the world, it's like we need to get those people either A, educated truly in the space to make really good guidelines or bring people into those regulatory bodies. I don't want to do it, <laughs> you know, but, but yeah. it, it is, it, it's a, it's a really tough one to, it's to kind of, one. for me, wrap my whole mind around the idea of them providing some guidelines. I definitely agree that guidelines need to be provided, but guidelines need to come from an educational standpoint and not from a lack of knowledge, trying to decide whether someone's going to be able to do X or Y. Yeah, but you know the, yeah. the the biggest fear there is like oh people controlling us and 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 the lack of regulation that nece doesn't necessarily protect anyone as we have seen from the lawsuits. Absolutely. So, so yeah, you know, so we have people leaving the U.S. and starting their companies abroad because of that. I have many yeah. friends who who are in my cohort uh, building crypto companies and did abroad. Yeah. I, my company is in the U.S. because uh, and I decided to make a centralized company in the Web three. Right. And and mm -hmm. and until there's clarity, I would not be able to dis fully decentralize or fully Absolutely. take advantage of crypto. Um, yeah. 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 So you're you're in the process. You're decentralizing. <laughs> yeah, it's the same idea. And and yeah. the way I look at it, you know, it's like uh, it's, I think people overuse blockchain in many use cases. You know, there are very few use cases that truly makes sense nowadays and and um is very early stage of technology mm -hmm. um you know it's like imagine netflix is trying to stream movies when we had dial up internet yeah it wouldn't work yes and, and a lot of people are using blockchain for everything when it's not yet possible you know right and, and it same happened during the first the internet when internet came out all the ideas we have today that we see today came out at the same time and people try to do all those mm -hmm. things but nothing mm -hmm. worked because it was too early and mm -hmm. and and for me it was the same. I, I I it was very clear to me that I saw other automation companies going decentralized, and I was like, this doesn't really solve the problem, doesn't really help right now, but later it will. So I decided to start with a centralized solution yeah. for a decentralized problem, mm -hmm. um, and 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 maybe one day with the hopes that the technology will catch up and we'll be able to decentralize, just like Netflix didn't start with streaming and then ended right. up. But I always knew they would go there, right? So right, yeah. Well, that's great. It, it's great to see, like, I mean, A, like, I have to applaud your efforts in, in building what you're building and doing what you're doing and how much traction you've already gotten with Bodo and just where you're going because the future is bright. Uh, you're doing amazing things. And I think that the world needs what you have to offer. So I just have to say thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. And thank yeah. you for educating people on, on crypto. It's super important. Absolutely. Of course. I, okay, in wrapping up, I do want to ask a, because I know part of your story is you started your photo, the startup company, when you had a new baby, like new baby on the way or new baby born. How, what was that whole process like? How old's the child now? Where are you at? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, it was, he, he's nine months now and uh, <laughs> soon so to precious. be 10. And yeah, it's, it's so cute. It's very, it was our first child. Um, so, you know, when I started, when I, when I did the, the, the hackathon, we, yeah. just, we had, my, my wife just got pregnant pretty much at the same time. And, yeah. and a few months later, I, I got the opportunity to join this accelerator. It has always mm -hmm. been my dream to have my own company. So I have tried other business before. Mm -hmm. um, so the accelerator would give me some enough money to, to quit my job. Mm -hmm. My wife wasn't working because she was doing an MBA. So in the middle of all that, with my wife have left her job to do an MBA and my and and being pregnant, yeah, um, and we didn't really have much savings, you know. So it's like, okay, this is gonna give us a runway until February, and the baby's due in December, oh and and we could pay rent until February, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then we would have to go on credit cards, I don't know, and yeah. whatever possible, and yeah, and so it was a tense 
uh, discussions we had. <laughs> um, my wife was incredible, very supportive, and and then decided to to leave Repo to to start. So the moment I received the money, the day after I quit, um, <laughs> I didn't quit when when I was accepted accelerator because I was like, until I have the money, I don't trust. So yeah, of course. The moment the money arrived which was in crypto, by the way, Filecoin from Protocol Labs. They, they oh, were yeah. one of our investors, Protocol yeah. Labs and Consensus Mesh were our first two investors in the Accelerator program. And um, and then, yeah, so so that, that that's how it happened. It was very tough. There were three months of Accelerator where I was still working in Ripple full time because I had to, my notice, mm -hmm. I, I had just started my team, the revenue intelligence team. So I was hiring and I was building the team. So I didn't want to leave mm -hmm. also. In, in a bad shape. Mm -hmm. um, so so I was working crazy hours. I had a oh pile God. of energy drinks here, you know, and uh, <laughs> and my wife was pregnant, so it was super difficult. Uh, for her, it was a difficult time. For me, it was, a, it was the first pregnancy, you know, and uh, and we leave, we were living in Switzerland, so none of our parents or relatives close around, so we were on yeah. our own. So the baby came. We had some parents for a few weeks, but then it, all on our own. and. It was tough. Um, I got, I managed to get the investment. We raised 3.7 million and that came in December 24th, the first check. The oh my God. baby was born December 10th. Wow. And, and it was just Christmas when we received <laughs> one and a half million from, from, from uh, FinTech Collective. Yeah. And, and, and I was like, oh, okay, I can breathe. Yes. You know, <laughs> yes. we are fine for, for some time now. And so it was, it was crazy, and 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 I I must say I really underestimated uh, how it is to to have a baby with our family around. Mm -hmm. um, we we split duties. We are in a country that we can't hire someone for support. It's very expensive, Switzerland. So um, right. I I do all the night shifts until I still do them. Right now my wife's yeah. with the baby now because he's sleeping, and I was like, Aww. okay, if he wakes up, can you handle because <laughs> of yeah. the podcast? Yeah. Um, but in general, I'm the one doing the nights, and um, and she's the one taking care most of the time during the day. Now she's working again, so she just started okay. recently. She graduated from the MBA. Um, nice. So it was crazy, but it all all work out, and we are super glad we did both. So yes, yeah, both. It, it, it always does work out, and I think the misconception. I have an 11 year old daughter. I was okay. going to school full time and working full time while pregnant with her. Um, so listening to your story, I I can feel the pressure and know what it can feel like in those situations. But I think the biggest misconception for most people is that they feel like they have to have all their ducks in a row or everything has to be all lined yeah. up before they they start their family. And sometimes you it just it happens happen. and you're yeah. not ready and you're but like you said, the way you so beautifully ended that is that it all works out. And here you are, baby's nine months old already, years are going to pass, and they're going to get to see dad and mom and be so, so proud of what they're creating and what they're building in the world. Yeah, that's exactly it. I, yeah. I think, you know, yeah, people do, you know, in some ways, I underestimated the work. But in other ways, I think in general, people do overestimate how mm -hmm. complicated it is to, to have a child and all that, you know, yeah. I think, you find a way. I, I have a couple of friends who are entrepreneurs and I spoke with them and they like, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's, you just live your life, you know, you just find exactly. a way, you always find a way and, you know, yeah. and we are highly adaptable. So, yeah. so we always find a way and it's definitely yeah. worth it. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. I'm excited to see how the rest of your journey unfolds and, you know, stay connected with you to continue the Web3 adventures as mass adoption does you know, continue to roll out. We're not there yet. Um, we will be there, um, mark my words, whether it's in five years or 10 years or 15 years or 20, it's definitely going to happen. Um, and it's going to be exciting to see where everybody's at. So thank you so much for being on the show. How can people connect with you? Thank you. Um, Twitter, it's okay. uh, Bren Aka, Bren o -C -A. Uh, uh, I just, if you go to Boda.io, you'll find pretty much all the information there. Our Discord. Sure. Our Discord is great as well. If you if you want to talk with us, we are always there. By the way, we use our Discord community server as our internal server as well as team. Uh -huh. So we are always there, everyone. So very cool. I will um definitely put all that in the show notes uh for people to be able to connect with you easily. They could just click the links um and get to where they need to go. So 
Thank you so much, Breno. Really appreciate your time today. And for those of you on this ride with us, as we pull into the station, make sure you still keep your hands and feet in the ride at all times until we come to a full stop and exit on your right. We will see you on the next one. You made it. Congratulations. That wasn't so bad, was it? I hope you laughed and learned a little bit more about this Web3 universe and how simple and fun it can really be. Would you be so kind as to leave us a review and share it with your friends and family? It would mean so much to get this out to more people as we embark on the greatest transfer of wealth that has ever happened in human history. Can't wait to see you on the next one.